Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show with your spicy hosts, Tara and Sylvie. We show up every episode to expose, uncover, and share what we know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under-discussed, and we are doing what we can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, we invite you to get social. Our Instagram is the.sexed.show, and we would love for you to give us a follow. Are more people noticing that increasing numbers of people around them seem to be in open relationships? Is non-monogamy the new cool relationship status? Join Tara and I on this episode to learn all about this seemingly buzzworthy relationship status. We reveal our vast personal experiences with non-monogamy, our theories on why people may be interested in it, all the different ways you can open up your relationship, and what non-monogamy isn't. Later, we bring our somatic sex-educated tools to the show and offer a somatic exercise to notice what happens in our body and genitals when different types of non-monogamy scenarios are shared. If you've been curious about this relationship status, stay tuned for more. And before we jump into the show, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that I work, live, play, and recorded this podcast on the traditional territories of the Indigenous people of Treaty 7 region and Métis region in Alberta 3. I express my gratitude to the Indigenous people who reside here historically and presently. And like we have done with every show... We want to start off with offering a somatic inquiry, and this one is called Portals to the Autonomic Nervous System. This was, I'm pretty sure, created by Kath and Jesse. It was. Yeah, that's I I didn't write that down, but my head went back there. And this is one that I really like when I'm feeling a little bit overstimulated, a little bit unregulated, and it's a great acronym for kind of getting back into the body, noticing what's going on. So if you're wanting, willing, open to doing this inquiry, I'd just like to invite you to either take a seat. You can also do this standing up. And if you're not wanting to do this, you can also jump ahead. So first, I'd just like to invite people to, if you're willing to, wanting to, close your eyes, Take a few breaths into your body. Say hi to your body. And I'm just going to go through the acronyms for portals. And if you're wanting to, you can do these invitations with Sylvie and I. So P is for pelvic floor. Breathe into that pelvic floor. Say hi to that pelvic floor. Squeeze and release the muscles. Squeeze and release. And while you're doing these slow or perhaps fast squeezes, focus separately on your butthole and your anus, your urethra, your vagina, or perhaps your penis, your genitals. And O is for open. Open and close your eyes. You can do this quickly, or you can do it slowly. Notice what feels best for you. R is for reduced breath. Breathe slowly, breathe less. Perhaps hold your breath when you inhale or you exhale. (sighs) T is for toes, wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers. And if that's not accessible for you, Find another part of your body that is open to a wiggle. Maybe shake your hands, your feet, or that body part. A is for ah. 
scrunch up your face, open your mouth and say, Ah. Ah. L is for look and listen. Name five specific things in your environment. Name five specific sounds around you. And lastly, we have S. S is for saliva. Make water inside your mouth. Notice the saliva in your mouth. My mouth is a little dry. I've had some coffee. (laughs) And that is the portals acronym created by Kath and Jesse. Sylvie, how was that for you? I love that um, somatic inquiry. I do that sometimes during my day if I'm feeling stressed and actually opening and closing my eyes is the thing that I do quite often. In neuroscience, they also teach you to do that if you want to center yourself and be present. There is something about going between your internal experience and your visual outfacing experience that can happen when you open and close your eyes, whether rapidly or slowly that just tends to bring you back to where you are. So I really love all of that and how it goes through, you know, your pelvic floor and creating the saliva in your mouth and all of the things that we don't tend to think about throughout our day. And it just brings our attention back and says, hi, I have a body. Look, this body is actually safe in this moment. I am okay. I am surviving, which sometimes our brain lies to us and tells us the opposite. So that is a very centering and grounding somatic inquiry. So thank you for guiding us through that, Tara. My pleasure. (laughs) And getting on with the show, today's topic is about all the wonderful ways people practice non-monogamy. So Sylvie and I both have some experience in non-monogamy. I can go first if you, yeah, Sylvie's nodding yes. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> so my partner and I have been together, it's going over nine years now. And when we first started out in our relationship journey, we were non-monogamous from the start and we really dove headfirst into it. Uh, we went to a lot of sex clubs. We went to a lot of events. Eventually we started getting invited to some of the local parties that the local community was hosting. And we were with a lot of people, especially in the first, I would say, two, three, four years of our relationship. And we pretty much would identify as swinger, lifestyle sort of couple. Uh, We always had mostly a, uh, what's it called? (laughs) I'm trying to think of this word. It was just us two. Like we wouldn't play separately. It was more of like a together thing that we would experience. And part of the reason for that was the compersion aspect. We really enjoyed watching each other have an experience, pleasure with other people in different scenarios. And it's so hot. we, it, it was hot. Yeah. Like it is definitely hot. hot. And we did a lot of like orgies, threesomes, foursomes, more sums. There was a lot of couples that we kind of would click with and, there would be, you know, regular play dates with those couples. And although the going to clubs was really hot at first, eventually we kind of veered away from that. It wasn't as sexy to just have these one night stands with people. We were kind of looking for more. And we also really enjoyed going to events. So like Naughty and Nolans and Young Swingers Week at Hedonism. We really enjoyed that kind of stuff and having, you know, four, five, six, seven days where we're in this community for a long extended period of time and experiencing so, so many different dynamics of what non-monogamy meant to us. So yeah, fast forward to now, we're definitely a little bit more, I don't want to say reserved, but more careful of who we share energy with and 
not quite as open as when we first started. So like I was telling Sylvie earlier, we kind of are Benjamin Buttoning non-monogamy. And we've been in so many different aspects from like what people consider poly to, you know, far on the swinger spectrum to like BDSM type of role playing too. So that's kind of the history that I have bringing into the show. Sylvie, do you want to share yours? Sure. So we are still very much in the training wheels part of our non-monogamy journey, my partner and I. I will say that I I knew from a young age that I was bisexual. And that was not something that worked for my family. They were not okay with sexuality other than, you know, straight straight was was what they were okay with. And that caused a lot of pain and suffering for me growing up, especially in my teenage years. There was a lot of angst associated with that. And I knew that the way to get my family off my back and to get them off my back about it quickly was to just start dating men. And I found one that I liked and I dated him and I married him very young. And, you know, just want everyone to know I'm still married to him and I still, I actually love him very much. What started out as a get my family off my back moment turned into a relationship that I would never want to replace. I want to spend the rest of my life with this person that I managed to choose at age 17. Wow. I, consider, I didn't I can, know that. <laughs> I consider myself very lucky that I found this, like my best friend and, you know, soulmate is a word that some people will resonate with and other people will be like, yeah, whatever. But I do consider him my soulmate and certainly my best friend and my life partner. And yet my bisexuality never went away. And so I actually started my non-monogamy journey non-ethically with cheating. And of course, I tried to explain that away with, you know, well, I'm bisexual and like, this isn't really cheating if it's with women. And, but of course it is, right? Because there is a difference between ethical non-monogamy and non-ethical non-monogamy. And I certainly started out the non-monogamy journey in a non-ethical way because I was confused and because I didn't think that there were other relationship models that would work. I'd never heard of non-monogamy. I didn't know that it was acceptable. I didn't even know it was acceptable to be gay. And so here I was denying myself of my actual sexuality and also denying myself of an, an orientation of non-monogamous. And it it hurts. It hurts when you are consistently being non-ethical. You hurt yourself and not to mention you also hurt your partner. And so I went to a lot of therapy, a lot of sex therapy, and found it unhelpful and blaming and shaming. And then I eventually found somatic therapy, which helped me to realize that actually I'm probably not monogamous in general. I'm just, that's not really how I'm wired. I'm monogamish, but not monogamous. And we can talk about that a bit later. But what happened was that I first had to come to terms with my sexuality of not being straight and not saying, oh, this is just something that I do and it's physical. It doesn't mean anything because that's not true. Um, and so I had to really, I remember my first somatic sex uh, coach asked me, you know, what are you here for? And I said, I really want you to make me straight and monogamous. And she said, uh-huh. And what else? And I said, no, that's it. Just straight and monogamous. That's I've heard that, you know, people can do that. You can make people straight if they go for therapy and stuff. And she said, are you talking about conversion therapy? And I said, yeah, yeah, I've read about it. I, I hope it works. And she said, it doesn't. And we won't be doing that. And I said, well, that's what I'm here for. So please try. And she said, right, what else? And I said, and also, I only want to have eyes for my husband. Please don't let me look at anyone else. I just want. And she said, you know what, honey? I think we're going to work on how to make you hate yourself less. And that was something that really stuck with me. And I was, I immediately said, I don't hate myself. I think I'm great. And she said, no, no, you have a deep self-loathing. And that was really when I realized that it's okay to be outside of that norm, to not be straight, to not be monogamous completely. And there's various degrees of non-monogamy and, you know, long story short, but we eventually opened up our relationship to the extent that we were comfortable with, and we are still finding our way with that. And also it is going quite well, right? But a lot of these things have to 
be taken. Sometimes, sometimes people just dive right in. Like you said, Tara, you know, you dived right in, in the beginning and that worked for you initially. And then now you've Benjamin buttons. And for us, we really started, you know, from scratch with having to rebuild trust, having to rebuild yeah. communication skills, having to really talk about, you know, what is important information to share and what is not important information to share. And what does non-monogamy mean to the other person? Because people can have different def definitions of what it means. And having to navigate all of that and really sit in the discomfort of having to have grown-up conversations, which was not something that I was used to and which a lot of people who aren't used to non-monogamy are not used to sitting in discomfort, having uncomfortable conversations, really working through things, working through emotions with our partners in ways that a lot of people just shut down, dissociate from, ignore, right. block. And that is why non-monogamy is hard and it is also super hot because it can bring you so much closer together because the amount of com communication that we have had to do now in our relationship is so much more than we ever had before. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's It definitely adds a layer of, I mean, every relationship has trust and communication in, in some aspects, but this really, I mean, if you're practicing it ethically, it's going to encourage more of that in your relationship. And I wish that we took more time to really just discover like our intention for wanting to be non-monogamous instead of really going like the swinger party route, because there was a lot of harm that happened to my body through that and not taking that time to slow down. And notice what we both wanted out of this. And it wasn't until we're at like year five and we're like, um, things are, things aren't feeling the best. And why is that happening? Why am I having anxiety attacks before this lifestyle party or swinger party? So mm -hmm. it, it took some time to unravel that. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about that being part of my niche is, <laughs> I really want to help couples and even singles who are interested in non-monogamy, like really set that foundation before yeah. jumping in. And some people will disagree. They're like, you just need to jump in and really experience it and fuck the theory. And I'm like, eh, yeah, that didn't work for me. Maybe some people, but it caused a lot of harm also. Yeah, definitely can. And again, when there's trust that has been broken, so if you've entered non-monogamy through a non-ethical route, and if you're trying to turn it into an ethical part mm. of your relationship, right. there's going to have to be a lot of repair there. There's going to have to be a lot of rebuilding of trust, a reestablishing of boundaries. There might be a lot of, you know, closing up actually before you decide to reopen because there's harm that has been done when there's been unethical non-monogamy and that harm has to be addressed and certainly has to be talked about and discussed before you proceed you know it's it's not all fun and games I sometimes think that monogamous couples have this view that non-monogamy is just this sort of free for all and it in my experience it is so much the opposite of that mm -hmm. nothing is a free for all in non-monogamy it is so very painstakingly communicated, worked out and boundaried in my experience. Obviously, the other people have different experiences with it, with it, but it certainly comes with a lot of rules. Yeah. And education too. Like yeah. there's the reason why we went more of the swinger lifestyle route is because we were unaware of other ways that you could practice non-monogamy. So you, whereas you're taught there's only a monogamous way in our society to be with a partner. Uh, I thought that there was only the swinger lifestyle way to be non-monogamous with your partner. And I wasn't really familiar with poly, monogamish, kitchen table poly, cuckold. Like I didn't even know about all of this until we were kind of already doing stuff. And to have that 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 knowledge beforehand would have been really helpful in determining what our intention was, why we were in it, what we wanted to get out of it. And 
what our morals and ethics were surrounding doing this as a couple or doing this separately. And I think that's that's kind of what's inspired Sylvia and me to do this podcast is we also want to talk a bit about what each of these different types of way of being non-monogamous are and things that we've kind of learned or experienced or picked up along the way. Would you call yourself Polly, Sylvie? I don't, I really struggle with the labels in non-monogamy. I really struggle with them. (laughs) Yes. And I don't know. I think, I think we need to create one just for people like us. Right. And, <laughs> and every poly person I've ever met defines themselves in a certain way that I'm like, oh, that's slightly different from something else that I've heard. Right. About. Like everyone seems to have their own definition of it. And I think that's cool. Uh, but at the same time, it can also get complicated. And and then obviously pe- we like structure as humans. So we try and put structure in everything. Mm-hmm. And then there are always the people who are like, well, if you're going to be poly, you have to do it this way. And this is wrong. Ugh, you're actually yes. poly. And, you know, then there's a lot of talk about like, you know, couples privilege and, you know, and then you have on, and we haven't even actually defined for our readers, what is non-monogamy, right? So it might be helpful to just start with a definition of what non-monogamy is. Do yeah. you want to take a stab at it or shall, shall I, or what would you like, Tara? Oh, I, yeah, I can say something to that. I, I think it would for me and how I view non-monogamy, it's, I, I hate the word using ethical, but I think it's more of like a consensual practice between everybody who's involved in, in whatever level it is. And it's just being open to having friendships that might be a little bit more than what our traditional view of friendships are or sexual intimacy with other people. But I, I think it really comes down to what you and the people involved want and what you have agreed on and what your limits are and what your desires are and what your intentions are. And whatever that looks like to you, it could be you're just going on platonic dates where you're holding hands and making out with another girl, or it could be going to Young Swingers Week and as a couple hooking up with like five to 10 other couples during that week. So it's a, it's very vast. And I think there's so many different ways that you can practice it, but having the consensual aspect and is a biggie for me. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you're right. There's so many different things that can fall under this umbrella of ethical non-monogamy. We're going to be talking about ethical non-monogamy because non-monogamy without the ethical part is cheating. Like that's, that's what that is. So when we're talking about ethical non-monogamy, there are so many different definitions of it. And we're not going to try and give you a definition, but I like that you use the word intimacy, Tara, because I think it is for me, what non-monogamy is, is having intimate relationships. And that doesn't necessarily mean sexual relationships, but intimate relationships with other people outside of a primary partnership. Or having them with more than one person can be non-monogamy. And that can be chatting. It can be texting. It can be just spending a whole lot of time with someone when you have a primary partner at home, right? And it Mm -hmm. doesn't actually need to be anything sexual about it. But there are some friendships that actually make primary partners feel marginalized and pushed to the side, which could be considered non-monogamous, right? Which would also need ethics and boundaries around them so I would say that non-monogamy ethical non-monogamy is just intimacy however you define intimacy with more than one person Mm -hmm. yeah that's it's so true I think I read this meme and it was about it was like best friends really are practicing a form of I think I sent this to you ethical non-monogamy Right. And, you know, I have my best friend and she's monogamous, but we have like our inside jokes. We talk almost every day, like we'll go to a concert and get a hotel room and sleep in the same bed. Like there's not any sex happening, but there's definitely a bond and a connection. I mean, I've known her 35 years, so it, like it's like sister love, you know? Yeah. And we do need that village, right? So you've read Sex at Dawn. I've read Sex at Dawn. A lot of 
non-monogamous people reference Sex at Dawn because it's one of the key books when it comes to non-monogamy. But what what Sex at Dawn will tell us is that actually monogamy was never meant to to be the the norm, right? We we consider it such a norm today, but it never ever was. Casual sex was crucial to our ancestors' survival. And mm-hmm. also this whole, you know, we say it to ourselves all the time. It takes a village. It takes a village. It gets thrown around in monogamous settings too. And I often think, I don't know what these monogamous people think they are saying when they say it takes a village, because it takes a village is a non-monogamous concept. And that doesn't just mean that you're shagging your whole village. It means that you are exchanging intimate parts of your life with other people, whether that's raising children or going through crisis, going through crisis, cooking together, doing laundry together. Like these are all things that in our past were very normal things to do as a community. Mm-hmm. And it was not normal for people to live in four person unit households of two parents and two kids. That right. is a really modern concept yes. that is not normal or, I mean, normal we put normal in air quotes always if you love to live in your four person household that's awesome that's amazing and no one is telling you that's bad it's just that that is not and how has we're never been a norm it's never been a norm yeah it, it and, started during colonization right exactly when we needed to pass down the the farming land the titles all of that yeah and If you haven't read Sex at Dawn, I highly suggest it because, and if you're interested in non-monogamy, it does a really great way of just exploring this and sharing what humans grew from and what things were like prior to colonization. Yeah. I mean, it looks at how agriculture basically ruined our health and our happiness, right? Because once we had parcels of land that needed to be passed on through the family, it Mm -hmm. forced us to separate from the village and Mm -hmm. to create these artificial units that were based on hereditary passing on of things and, you know, things that we owned. And that has really been to the detriment of our happiness because we are not happy. We are overwhelmed and we are isolated. And many of us are miserable in that state. And when we look at the sexual and social behavior of our ancestors, it's super similar to that of our closest relatives, the animal kingdom, the chimps and the bonobos. Bonobos! Who have, who have sex for any kind of reason, right? Yeah. Like, it makes them cl- like makes them closer. It makes their society function better. They will have sex to repair an argument. They will have sex to just hang out with someone. They will have sex if they are just having a good day or a bad day. And that is a lot closer to what humans used to be like mm-hmm. before we had land that we needed to pass on land. to our children. <laughs> land. Land. And one point too is like DNA testing of children or like any, even like in crime scenes, that wasn't around until the 1980s. So right. how did you even know that these people were the father? Oh, because, you know, they looked like whatever. But, you know, sex used to be considered a community resource. Yeah, absolutely. Both males and females used to engage in sexual intercourse with whoever they wanted. It was a multi-male, multi-female mating system. And it was a super effective way to keep people relaxed, amiable, and cooperative. Yeah. And we've given that up for capitalism basically. Absolutely. I was just about to say that we've given that up for capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like different types of non-monogamy, one that really sticks out and that I feel has been more common, especially in like, let's say the Gen Z younger kind of generations is polyamory. And I see, even when I went to a concert, I want to say two years ago, there's like this group of younger you know, I'm 35, so probably like 20 to 25. And they're all making out with each other, girls, guys. And I'm like, this was not something that was common when I was that age. That's for sure. I was definitely the outcast for being like that. And I just feel like more of the younger generation are adopting like the polyamorous kind of, I'm going to date multiple people at times. 
the sort kids of, are all right. The kids right. are all right. <laughs> you know, it, but then it also does come down to capitalism, doesn't it, Tara? Because it's fucking unaffordable to live yes on your own in this in this environment you know back in the 1960s 70s even the 80s people could work one job and buy a house and go on vacation and have two cars and that was not the kind of financial hardship how how many people do you know today who work a standard mid-level job who can afford any of those things yeah we're still renting (laughs) because we can't afford a house (laughs) You know, we had we had friends who are not actually non-monogamous in the sexual way, but we had friends who, because they were living in, in the Bay Area, which is incredibly expensive, and they had a kid, and they didn't have any parents or anyone in the area to help them out, they decided to move in with five other families. They rented a wow. mansion. They rented a mansion, five families together, and all the families had at least one kid of similar age. And all the parents took turns in watching the kids. Everyone did a turn doing laundry. Everyone did a turn cooking. And they had this beautiful collective house. And it was amazing. Crazy. And that worked financially yeah. because they didn't have to pay incredible amounts of money to live in a very nice house in a very nice neighborhood with very good school districts with a swimming pool and all the nice things that we cannot afford on our own. Yep. Yeah. I've and, thought of that myself. Like, fuck it. <laughs> and if you are also having sex with all these people, how much fun is it to live in that house? I mean, amazing. Yeah, no, I I totally can see how that would be a benefit, definitely, economically. And I've even seen on TikToks like these communal, these communal mansions where there's like 20, you, you know, under 45 people living together and I don't think there's any kids that lived there but you know they had like this structure and they lived in a really nice area of the city and they had nice things in that house and you had your room and there was literally this is so funny there was one bathroom that was converted into just the sink room and so there's like eight sinks with mirrors going around so that everybody could kind of like get ready and didn't have to take one bathroom so people could you know just use the toilet if they needed to use the toilet or use like this sink room and they had like two of those it was it was pretty cool I I don't know it might be a little excessive for me with that many human beings but to have a few good friends or other couples to do that with Hell yeah. I'm all about getting back to a more village, more communal yeah. environment. I think that the isolationism of the nuclear family <coughs> is really, it's hurting us. Mm-hmm. There's There are so many people who are suffering from depression and anxiety and loneliness, chronic loneliness. And loneliness can actually shorten your lifespan there are studies out there that show that loneliness is a factor in lessening longevity Hmm. and we're doing this to ourselves we don't actually need to be doing it and I think what you said now about younger people becoming more interested in polyamory and I think that they've had enough they've had enough They're, they're seeing how the previous couple of generations have not really made this work very well that we're not very happy and the younger generation right. is saying, screw this shit. Let's do it differently. And good for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> there's so many ways that you can practice polyamory too, you know, from kitchen table polyamory, which means you, everybody sits at the kitchen table and talks about everything that's going on. And I know people who are like that and they have like six people living in the house together and that's super cool. And then there's, you know, the closed B, which I think kind of what I was in when we had a girlfriend, you know, there is me in the middle and my girlfriend and my partner. And, but at times we would all kind of be together. So like, this is why labels is really hard for me. I'm like, fuck, I don't know. (laughs) There's throuples, there's triads. There's solo poly, which you aren't with a partner who's like primary. primary, Yeah. And typically you live alone. 
I find most sol- solo poly people I know live alone. There's, I mean, and again, here it comes down to like the the alphabet soup of the <laughs> labeling right. conundrum mm-hmm. where, you know, I, I never know if, if someone who says that they're solo poly is also a relationship anarchist or, or not, right? Because right. that's another term that gets thrown around a lot. Could you maybe just explain a little bit about what relationship anarchy is to those who might not know what it is? Yes. So relationship anarchy, this used to really confuse me the first time I heard about it. But it's a term that actually draws its tenets from political anarchy. And it means that when you're in a relationship, when you're a relationship anarchist, you don't believe that you should be bound by any rules that aren't agreed upon by the involved parties. So, and and that can differ from relationship to relationship. What it basically means is that you are not being hierarchical about any of the relationships that you are in, whether that's a friendship, whether that's a romantic partnership, whether that's a family relationship, we don't rank romantic partners as more important than friends or more important than family. There's no built-in prescriptions about what a partnership has to look like. So for example, you could have a friendship with someone who you're not sleeping with and that relationship could be as important to you as a relationship with a person that you have a child with. Mm-hmm. That's what relationship anarchy can look like. Of course, there's a lot more that goes into relationship anarchy, but we aren't going to go into like major definitions. No. no, the whole podcast isn't about relationship anarchy. Correct. We just want to give you a little sprinkle of what each one is that we're familiar with. So Tara, tell me a little bit about swinging because that's part of the community that you're in or yeah. that you have been in. So tell me what that is like. Swinging sometimes is also called the lifestyle in quotations. And typically I find it's mostly couples who are in the lifestyle and it kind of varies. There's a spectrum. Either you're going to have people who literally are just in it to fuck and have sex with other people. And then on the other side of the spectrum, people are more of looking for casual sex, but with a a certain level of connection established. And typically it's parties, sex clubs, adult clubs, resorts. Usually swinger lifestyle people will frequent these places. And a lot of like community parties held at people's houses and stuff. And Sometimes like a little group will be made. So there'll be a group of swingers who kind of play together depending on how each other feels. Sometimes there's separate play. Sometimes there's play with just couples. But really the basis of it is to have sex, usually penetrative sex, full swap as swingers call it, with couples to couples. And it's really drifted away from the keys parties you don't see that kind of stuff happening there is more consent and choice and voice being used in the community although I still feel there's work to do yeah so is it true to say that swinging would be more on sort of a physical level and less on an emotional level yeah from my experience I mean we had really great friends in it but the minute that we kind of decided we we didn't know if we were going to be part of that community anymore, like a lot of them disappeared mm-hmm. because they weren't having sex with us. And do you date in the swinging community? Yeah, like uh, like we did. That was a really important aspect for us was to go on dates and meet these people first. And sometimes the first date meant that we were fucking later on. And sometimes it meant that we wanted to have another day. And sometimes it meant that it was a no and we weren't interested in playing with those people. Cool. So now let's talk (laughs) about monogamish. Yeah. Something you talked about earlier. Yeah. So again, labels can be so confusing to people, but what happens if you really are kind of into the concept of monogamy and let's say, you know, for example, for me, I am married to my partner. We have two children together. I have no interest in breaking up the family unit or inviting more people into our family unit, but we are still non-monogamous loosely. And so I would, I describe that as monogamish. And that means that I will occasionally have another partner 
or that we will go to play parties and play there. But that for the most part, we we remain a monogamous unit, but sometimes we play with others. And that can sound sort of, sort of like swinging lifestyle, but also I I do tend to develop relationships with one particular person outside of the relationship. And that does tend to look a, a bit more like poly and dating and sometimes comes along with labels like girlfriend. So that is part of the monogamous lifestyle where you're not necessarily having tons of extra partners. Maybe there's just one extra partner. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just one person that you're dating outside of your you know, primary partnership. So that's what monogamish can look like. Or monogamish can look different to so many different types of people. Do you have a different experience of monogamish, Tara? Mm, like, not really. I mean, I feel like with monogamish, connection is typically important for everybody who's involved in it. And I think it's it's less about just going out and having sex with random people. I think it's more intentional. Yeah, I definitely am looking for more of an emotional connection when I'm connecting with people outside of my primary partnership. And the sex is a great bonus, but mostly it starts off as as friendships and pretty intense friendships. Friendships right. where it's like, I really want to spend a lot of time with this one particular person outside of my part- my primary partnership. And I will rearrange a whole bunch of stuff in my life. So I get to like actually spend a whole bunch of time with this new person who I'm starting to get to know. But that also means I don't have time for a bunch of different people. Mm-hmm. So I tend to like focus in on. And do they like typically meet your husband and your family? If things are going well, then okay. yes. It's pretty hard when it comes to introducing people to kids. Yeah, uh, For me, that gets tricky because kids get attached and... I also don't want to bring people into their life and then have them disappear. And then the kids thinking that that's somehow to do with them or that that they didn't like them or whatever. So I'm pretty careful about introducing people to my kids now. That's a, a learning that has happened over the last few years. But I definitely want my husband to meet them. And again, that can be tricky because people are like, oh, are you just bringing me home because you want you want to have like a threesome and I'm always very careful to say no I actually I don't want a threesome I'm not that's not what I'm looking for that's actually not what my that's not my preference I don't particularly enjoy threesome situations but I he he is my partner and my best friend and he typically has a really good judge of character as well so I really appreciate his opinion on the people that I am interested in because sometimes he's like hmm I don't know about them for you. And then that matters to me. Or if he's like, wow, they're so cool. Like really like them. Then that also matters to me because his opinion matters. So it sounds like communication is a really big aspect of being monogamous too. Not only with your partner, your primary partner, but other people that you're interested in dating and communication about what everybody wants to get out of it. Because when you're a swinger, it's like, we all kind of know, <laughs> right? but monogamish, it's like, you need to have that notice, trust, value, communicate that you learn in Wheel of Consent about yeah. what you're looking for and what you're able to give and what you want to receive. And it might not even be sex, maybe, exactly. right? Yeah. Like in this whole, like going back to like, it takes a village concept, like maybe your partner is really good at certain things, but is like really not good at making out. Maybe making out is just not their skill, right? And you really love making out. And it's something that like really turns you on. And maybe if you're monogamish, you're meeting up with someone who you're not actually having sex with, but you're having really hot makeout sessions with. And you really like to hang out with them. They're a fun person. You like to go out on dates. You like to make out wherever, whenever. But then you're going back to your partner and you are doing other things with your partner that they are really good at and also having your need met for really good makeout sessions, but not necessarily with your partner. I like it. It's kind of also like BDSM, not monogamy. Right. Which is also on our list. So tell me about that, Tara. (laughs) Well, just, hmm. So I don't know if you've done like the Jaya 
quiz about what your erotic blueprint is? Yeah. So mine came back shapeshifter and I have a more stronger desire with kink. However, my partner, like he's not into kink at all. So for me, like a lot of times I'm non-monogamous, A, because I'm pansexual and I like to experience different genders, but also I like to play with kink and I'm not going to have that really fulfilled with him. So going and finding another partner or another person or a friend or somebody who's willing to explore and do that with me, that's a huge turn on. And for me, that's like BDSM non-monogamy. I know you go to like kink parties and fetish parties. And I think there's a whole other level of non-monogamy, even when it comes to like DS relationships and the whole respect thing, if somebody's collared. Yeah. And again, we're going back to that concept of not every person can meet all of your needs. So no one person is going to meet all of your needs. Yes. And also just because we fall in love with someone and decide that we want to move in with them and have children with them or have a life with them or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be on the same page sexually about everything. Mm -hmm. We're very complex erotic beings and we all have a myriad of different turn-ons and fantasies and erotic desires. And if one of your erotic desires is kink and BDSM and your partner is 0% into that, are you supposed to just say, oh, well, I guess I'll live the rest of my life without experiencing any kink or BDSM, exactly. even though I'm super into it? Yeah. Do we just give up because the other partner is like, no, I'm not into that, sorry. Or do we say, okay, I totally get that you're not into that. I'm super into you not being into that because I love you for so many other reasons. I would like to get my kink needs met. Could I get them met with another person? How do you feel about that? And then that's where negotiation starts, right? Where someone will say, well, I'm okay if you want to, you know, go to a party and be flogged or have a bondage session with someone, but I would rather that you're not having full sex with them, penetrative sex, penetrative, yeah. right? Yeah. And that can be a, a negotiation or a discussion where you could be like, well, that works for me because I can then get my dose of kink, but I don't necessarily have to violate our relationship boundaries, which is ethical and important. So I love that that's on our list as well, because mm -hmm. it is, you know, again, when we're talking about non-monogamy, we're not necessarily talking about penetrative sex non-monogamy, right? There's a whole bunch of different things that we can do that are erotic and sensual and emotional and intimate that don't necessarily involve genitals even. Right. And, or the other partner, like even with cuck holding, mm -hmm. you know, typically it's the, the woman in, in a relationship where there's a guy and a woman and he gets turned on by watching his wife with other other people most usually other men that's typically but cuck holding goes back like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years like you're talking about like victorian era where guys were turned on by watching their wives have sex with other people like you see i see it in all my smutty books that i have and like this is this has been around for a while <laughs> Yeah. And there's, I mean, and there's obviously this cuckolding, which has an element of humiliation in it, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. for some people, they want to see their partner be with someone else and feel humiliated mm -hmm. because that's a, that can be an erotic, erotic feeling, an eroticized feeling that, oh, she, she is having better sex with that person than I could ever give her. His penis is satisfying her so much more than my penis can satisfy her. And for some people, they can turn that into an erotic feeling that is very fulfilling and satisfying for them and for other people they don't want that humiliation involved in it and they just really very much enjoy the voyeurism of being able to see their partner get enormous amounts of pleasure with someone else and that they get to watch it kind of like their own personal porn show featuring yeah. their favorite person so and that that's I think called hot wifing if I'm correct. yes yeah I actually I didn't write that down so good thing you brought that up and it, it's similar. It looks very similar to cuckolding and it just doesn't have that element of humiliation. In it. And then kind of even further on that spectrum is like the don't ask, don't tell, which I, 
experienced a bit. And personally, I am not a fan of playing with people who have this dynamic set up. But really what it is, is there's an agreement in place that yes, there's going to be an aspect of open relationship and you're not sharing anything about it. You're not sharing who you're going on a date with. You're not sharing the details of how it went. You're not sharing like texts or sex or how far you're going with this person. And that's, that's it. You just don't want to know. And usually I find this happens when a couple where one person's not interested in non-monogamy and the other person is. And so they have a don't ask, don't tell policy in place. Yeah. And I think it is probably one of the more dangerous ones on our list. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking of engaging in non-monogamy in any way, it may sound appealing because it sounds like, oh, yay, we don't have to do any of the really hard conversations or the things that we said non-monogamy requires. I think that that isn't necessarily true. Don't ask, don't tell has the potential to really, really blow up in your face. Yeah. Because first of all, just because you're not asking or you're not telling doesn't mean that the other person isn't imagining. And our imaginations tend to skew to the negative always. And if you are having insecurity and you are imagining the worst case scenario and it's actually not the worst case scenario, you're going to be building up resentment and anxiety and fear when you could just be communicating openly and realizing that actually things are not quite as bad as you imagined Mm -hmm. or that there's nothing for you to be concerned about. And then also sometimes it's really important to know where you stand, right? Because if you're doing don't ask, don't tell, and you've been doing it for years and all of a sudden your partner comes to you and says, look, I know we've had a don't ask, don't tell policy for the last five years, but I've actually been dating the same woman now for five years and we've I'm in love with decided, her. Yeah, we've mm-hmm. decided we want to be together. I've seen that happen literally with my own ass. <laughs> and it comes out of the blue for you. Yeah. And what are you supposed to do with that? Yeah. Right? So that's where don't ask, don't tell can really, like it sounds seductive because it sounds like, oh good, I don't have to do all of this work. But that is a dangerous thing to do. In my opinion, even though... It is really hard and you have to have a lot of maturity to have those non-monogamous communications and discussions. It is so worth it Mm -hmm. because then you know where you stand. You're on the same page. You can negotiate. You can't negotiate and don't ask, don't tell. You can't say like, hey, this makes me uncomfortable. Or, you know, when you did that, I felt this because you don't know. And then when it hits you, you're like, whoa, all of that makes me uncomfortable. But all of a sudden you've given up your power. But it works for some people. Sometimes the secrecy aspect is a fetish. Like there are people who find it really hot to cheat. Like they get really turned on when they're cheating. And so that's kind of where don't ask, don't tell can somebody sometimes be used or manipulated into the relationship. Yeah. And I think as long as, as long as it's negotiated beforehand and you know the risks And that's the thing, everyone who gets into non-monogamy has to be aware that there are risks, just like everything has risks. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I like to talk about it as being like on a risk continuum, right? There are certain parts of non-monogamy that are less risky than other parts. I would say that don't ask, don't tell is a pretty high risk activity on that continuum. But some people would argue that for them, that's the only way that it's going to work. And Mm -hmm. if it works for them, that's amazing. Like, good for them. Would absolutely not work for me. And I would feel incredibly anxious, insecure, and out of control in a don't ask, don't tell situation. I would have to agree (laughs) with myself. I would, yeah. Tried a lot of different types. and, And you're right. There is a lot. There is a level of risk with each one. Like we were talking about before, risk versus reward. And you said, you said something about like swinging, maybe it's not as riskier because there's not as much connection or foundation that's built between you and the people you're having sex with or being intimate with. And I was like, well, yeah, but at the same time, because it's sometimes a selfish mentality swinging, people don't feel the need to like disclose if they have 
an STI or when their last panel was, or if they have cold sores on their mouth that you could potentially get on your genitals and contract genital herpes. And it's just because they're like, oh, I'm not going to see you again. This is like one and done or we're on a trip. I'm never going to see this person again. So they feel like they don't have to disclose that type of stuff, which that's a huge risk. Yeah. So, I mean, it's try it all out, see what works to you. But that's partially why we're going to be doing these, this little somatic inquiry later on. Tell, tell me about the somatic inquiry. What are we doing? We're just going to kind of bring, bring the listeners into their bodies and just offer, I think we have four different scenarios of what we're going to offer and to see what you notice in your body, in your genitals, what's kind of going on, how it makes you feel. Do you notice like your heart getting like racy and you're like, Ooh, I'm tight. I don't like this. Or do you notice, Ooh, I'm a little bit curious. This sounds kind of hot. This might be something I'd be interested in doing. Okay. Before we get into that, we also want to touch a little bit about what non-monogamy, specifically ethical non-monogamy, isn't. And the first thing is obviously cheating. It's not cheating. It's two consenting people or more consenting people. And coercion, manipulation, is there's that shouldn't be used. I've seen it be used, but that's not what non-monogamy is. Yes, and also important to say that ethical non-monogamy is not when one person decides to be non-monogamous and tell their partner that they're being non-monogamous without their partner's consent. Ethical non-monogamy is when both people agree and there are some sort of rules and boundaries that protect that relationship, Mm -hmm. right? Like That is what ethical non-monogamy is. If one person who is in a relationship suddenly decides that they are non-monogamous and that the other person has to like it or lump it, that is not ethical non-monogamy. Yeah. It's, yeah, manipulation or coercion. Yeah. And it's also not a Band-Aid for a rocky relationship. I've seen that before. Couples are like, oh, things are really strained. And so I think we're just going to be non-monogamous. And there's times where my partner and me have taken breaks because we didn't feel like our relationship was strong enough or in the right spot to be fucking other people or be intimate or or open ourselves intimately with other people. And I think being aware of where you stand in your relationship and and how much work you've put into building that strong foundation is really important. Yes. It's and not going to fix it. No, <laughs> it won't sure. fix it. It'll make it like, worse. Just like having a baby doesn't fix a bad relationship, right? When you have a rocky relationship, you need to work on it and you need to right. focus on the other person. And if your relationship has hit the rocks for whatever reason, you need to figure out what the reason is because it's not going to make it any better if you start seeing other people and ignoring the reason. The reason just doesn't magically go away. And in fact, you might find that that will take you further away from the person that you want to be working on a relationship with. I had a friend who she had this analogy of the lifestyle swinging non-monogamy is like a magnifying glass over your relationship. It's going to magnify the good things and the bad things. So if you're bad at communicating, it's going to magnify that. If you're good at communicating, it's going to magnify that. So that's something to think about before deciding if it's right for you. That's such a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And it's so true as well. And it also, I mean, if you read Jessica Fern's Polysecure, she talks about how polyamorous relationships have an ability to bring up your attachment wounds tenfold. Oh, yeah. That, you know, we all have either an anxious, avoidant, or stable attachment style. And whatever attachment style we have, when you are in a non-monogamous relationship, again, that relationship style becomes very amplified. Because if you are an anxiously attached person, if you have more than one partner, you're going to have more anxious attachments to deal with. If you're an avoidant person, if you're in a relationship with multiple people, your avoidant tendencies are going to come back and bite you in the ass with multiple people, not just with one. So you have to be aware of 
your attachments Mm -hmm. and your attachment style and how non-monogamy is going to impact that. Yeah, it certainly helps to be aware of that. (laughs) Yeah. And really quickly too, just because people sometimes generalize non-monogamy, it isn't for just men. It's not just for couples. It's not just for good looking people or what society deems beautiful people. There's all different types of bodies, all different types of people, genders. There's singles, there's couples, there's triads. You're not limited by who you are. It's basically what I'm trying to say. (laughs) All bodies, all abilities, anyone who wants to be in an ethical non-monogamous relationship and who has the tools to communicate about it can do it if that is their desire. Yeah. And I think it's time maybe to go into our little somatic inquiry that we've (laughs) decided to put up here. So we're going to go through different scenes Mm -hmm. and see how it lands in our listeners' bodies. Right. That's the plan. And just to help kind of bring you into your body in this moment, I'm going to offer just a little teeny body scan and then we'll go into the scenarios. So if it's possible, I would invite you to close your eyes right now or even just soften your gaze. If you're driving, don't do that, please. (laughs) And just notice your body. Take breath into your body. Notice the breath. Notice the temperature of the air on your body, the temperature of the air going into your body. Perhaps noticing the texture of clothing on your skin. And while you're doing this, take a breath into your genitals. Notice your genitals. If you're sitting or standing, perhaps give a little wiggle or shift so you can really feel your genitals and say hi to them. And Sylvie and I are going to share these scenarios and I'm just going to invite you to notice what comes up in your body. Notice if anything changes, if anything like a word or a color or a texture comes up. So scenario number one, you're a partner and you are getting ready to head out to a local adult sex club for the first time ever. They are in the shower while you're in front of the mirror doing what you usually do before going out for the night. You're talking about the possibilities of what tonight could bring. They're sharing a hot fantasy they have of you making out with someone the same gender as you. They share this is extremely hot for them and a huge turn on. What do you notice in your body? Hmm. I notice a tingliness in my body when I imagine that scenario. I notice excitement. I'm like, ooh, a little bit of like bouncing in my chair, feeling good, feeling light. I feel a sort of a a buzzing in my fingertips. Mm. That's where I mostly feel turn on first is in my fingertips. But also there's this sort of incredulity of, oh, my partner has these thoughts. <laughs> that's so like, that's so interesting. I didn't know that they had these erotic thoughts and fantasies. I thought I was the one who had fantasies, right? So it's sort of discovering a layer of complexity about your partner too, which can be really hot. Do you want to share the next one, Sylvie? Oh yeah. Okay. So next scenario. After a lot of conversation, your partner and you decide to each put yourselves on a dating app. Could be Tinder, could be Field, could be Bumble. The okay Cupid, a lot of poly people on the okay Cupid. They immediately hit it off with someone and start planning a first date with this person within the next couple of days. Before it gets set in stone, 
your partner asks to sit down with you and talk about how you're feeling. What do you notice in your body? Mm. A little like happy dance kind of went away and I'm like rolling the skin on my legs, like anxiety a little bit. And a little bit more rigid, like even my shoulders, I feel them like, ooh. I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this. It's a little bit scary. Yeah, I have to say that personally for me, I do not like it. Yeah. There's a feeling in my body of like a heaviness, like a weight that drops down into my stomach and my mouth gets a little bit dry and there's a bit of a buzzing towards the back of my neck and my ears which doesn't feel very comfortable and I realized that yeah I mean I think that's probably what jealousy feels like in my body mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. there's definitely some jealousy there's definitely some insecurity that will come up and definitely some of that anxiety as well mm-hmm of will they like that person better than me? Am I going to lose attention because my partner wants to be with someone more exciting, more interesting, more good looking? Right. The comparison starts straight away. And also like, I want to go on a date. Yeah. Pick me. Yeah. Why didn't no one pick me. <laughs> pick me, girl. <laughs> hmm. And that can be tough, right? That can, that's where a lot of people fail with non-monogamy because that is, you know, when people start out with like, how do we go about non-monogamy? And it's like, okay, we'll set up a dating profile, like see what happens. And those are really the moments that when shit becomes real and you actually see that your partner is getting attention, Mm -hmm. that's when you actually have to face a reality of a situation of oh this could happen right. and and how how do I actually feel about that and for some people the compersion will kick in straight away and they'll be like that's amazing I'm so happy for you and for other people it can be a sort of a oh god no like this was all fun and games when it was theoretical uh-huh. but now I'm letting you go out in the world dress up put on your best suit your nicest cologne take someone else out for dinner while I'm stuck at home with the kids and you're going to be having a great time and maybe making out with someone. And I don't get you. You don't, you're not giving that to me. That can feel really difficult Mm -hmm. initially. And if there's not good communication around it, or if your partner comes back from the date and doesn't reconnect with you or doesn't ask you, hey, like I see that you shut kind of shut down when I was preparing for my date. Do you want me to not go? Like, should we talk about it? Like, let's talk about some of these things that are coming up for you. Mm -hmm. If you can find a deeper level of connection through those feelings, that's when you can set yourself at ease and be like, oh, yeah, I was feeling insecure and a bit jealous and feeling like I wasn't picked, so I was rejected. But now that I see that you really care, and that you're communicating with me about it. And, and that, acknowledging. Right. Mm-hmm. Now I feel closer to you. And now I feel like, yeah, I really do want you to go on that date and be happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, like don't dissociate. <laughs> right. And that can be really tough. And that's why it's really useful to have a coach in those situations as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Having that extra person be able to talk you through your emotions and be like, okay, well, what's underneath that feeling? Why do you think you were feeling that? What could your partner do in that moment that would have reassured you? What would make this feel safer for you? Or what would make you feel more in control, right? We're never in control of another person. We always have the illusion that we are, but we are not. But what would make you feel like you have more control in this moment? And that can be really reassuring. Anything that you want to add to that, Tara? What would make you feel secure in that situation? I think, yeah, the acknowledging aspect and asking what I needed. And, you know, like if, let's say leading up to that, we had, you know, our weekly date night and I felt like 
that was established and we've been spending that quality time together previously, then I probably would feel less anxious. But I mean, it's just, it's the holidays. We've all been really busy with family obligations and really like relationships tend to take a little bit of a back burner during these crazy times. And so if this was to happen like today or tomorrow with my partner, it would be a really hard conversation where I'm like, well, I'm not really getting what I need. So I don't know why you're taking your energy and investing it into somebody that you're not in partnership with right now. Like, yeah. can we get ourselves feeling better or myself feeling more secure and taken care of in this relationship before you start going on dates with other people? Absolutely. I think we have time for one more. I don't have it written down, but do it off okay. the cuff. Because this is something I actually went through. Okay. So six months ago, you and your partner made a vacation booking to go to a resort that is clothing optional. The days come and you're at this resort, you currently have your bathing suits on, but you know that there is a line in the sand that if you cross, you have to remove your clothing. So you start walking, you're hand in hand with your partner, you get to the sign that says, this is the nude side, please take your clothes off. You look at your partner, what are you thinking? What are you noticing going on in your head? As a nudist, I'm thinking, yay, why didn't <laughs> we too. take our clothes off <laughs> earlier? Same. I'm a card-carrying member of a nudist colony, so... <laughs> but I... I know from bringing, trying to bring friends with me to nudist beaches or to the nudist colony that a lot of people struggle with this one. Yeah, this body is image is a huge aspect of non-monogamy. Yeah. Like, and people do think that people are looking at them specifically. And their genitals. I'm going to stare at your genitals. Nobody stares at your genitals. <laughs> I always think that's really funny when people say that and they're just like, don't you care that people might be looking? And I'm like, I, people look at me more in the eyes in a nudist colony. Exactly. In the street when I'm fully clothed. Right. When I'm uh, fully I agree. clothed in the street, people will literally look at my body in a way that makes me go, Ugh. But <laughs> in a nudist colony, people will actually have conversations with you while looking at your face, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. And yeah, it's like... It's funny because I have my hood pierced, my clitor clitoral hood piercing. And it will be like a day three at a nude resort. And people are like, oh, I didn't even notice you had a piercing. And I'm like, you've been around me for three days naked. How did you not know? They're like, well, I'm not like staring at your pussy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but people do. I mean, we live in a, in a culture where body image were blasted with Instagram swimsuit models and Filters. men's health you know or women's running magazines and there's all these people who look a certain way that we believe we have to look and mm -hmm. none of us look like that none of us I mean, flash they don't even look like they that. don't yeah they're photoshopped to look like that yes and of course we're going to hold ourselves to these bizarre unrealistic standards and then when we take off our clothes we're like oh don't look at me i'm a freak i am a quasimodo looking not normal one boob is bigger than the other my thighs are huge like whatever i have stretch marks i have scars like right? yeah we think these horrible things about our body and then we project them onto other people and how they're going to view our bodies and people are just looking at us and thinking i hope they don't notice my scar my cellulite like nobody is looking at you and thinking oh she doesn't really look like a swimsuit model from Instagram. No one is thinking that. Mm -hmm. But we have it in our heads that that is how people are sizing us up. And they are not. And it can be so liberating. What I've often found with people when they do let go of their clothes and their, their hangups around nudism, when they do take off their clothes and they are in an environment where other people are naked, they mostly just think, what a fucking relief. Mm -hmm. What a relief. And no one is looking at you like that. No one is sizing you up. And you just think, oh, we all have bodies. What a revelation. We all have bodies. And all of them are different. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's been my experience, like going to hedonism. There's all types of bodies there, all kinds. And I'd have people come up to me after their five days there. And they're just like, this was mind blowing for me just to see that I'm normal and to feel like I'm normal. I'm like, yes, thank you. Oh my God. Woo. Praise. <laughs> yeah. It's going to say praise be because I've been watching The Handmaid's Tale and I'm like, ew, no, don't say that. <laughs> Blessed be the nudists. Uh... <laughs> so I we're, we don't have time to do the IG questions because we're already over time. I know we okay. are. But we'll we'll do our little wrap up. Thank okay. you, listeners. Thank you, Sylvie, new co-host. <laughs> Thank you, Tara, for having me. <laughs> this is so much fun. It is, yeah. It's nice to have our energy together. I think we're getting more connected we're fi- too. We're figuring it out. We're figuring we it out. Yeah. We started by touching each other's genitals. <laughs> and now true. we're starting to figure each other out on a non-genital level. <laughs> Yes, online, long distance. Long distance <laughs> genital touching. Uh, yeah. But this is great. So again, thank you to our amazing listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. Tara, if we're looking for more ways to connect our listeners to us, how do they do that? They can go to each of our individual Instagrams because we have all of our links in there. I think that's the easiest for me. So mine's sex ed for the modern bed and yours is sex and sensibility. But the E in sex is a three because Instagram sucks. <laughs> it does. It's not fun. So thank you again. And until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body and stay in presence.